Anyway, oh, this is an uh, <clears throat> interesting uh, talk for President's Day relating to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> but then again, maybe not so odd because Hitler took the office of presidency and then chancellor and put them together to make Fuhrer. So yeah, okay, well, it's president, I guess. Uh, if you take a look at that handout here, uh, this comes out of um, Mein Kampf, actually, uh, talking about Hitler and the Nazi party. Terror at the place of employment, in the factory, in the meeting hall, and on the occasion of mass demonstrations will always be successful unless opposed by equal terror. That's a telling statement by the Fuhrer. Mm. But then again, that's not surprising because of the fact we're dealing with a man who understands, uh, understands or seems to understand violence. I mean, what else does he have, really, in the end? Because when you understand his meaning of a state, and we're going to get into that as part of the Nazi Party doctrine. But then again, when you look at Nazi Germany, uh, there's two factors that really come out here. I mean, they, they're really telling here. One, Nazi Germany will be a single party state. You know, other parties need not apply especially after July 14, 1933, when all other parties were really made illegal after that. And you begin to see at this point, I mean, when, 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 when you go back and see, you know, this, this, this progression here on January 30, 1933, that Hitler is asked to assume the chancellorship. Keep in mind, it, this bounces off what Hitler understood when he was at Landsberg prison after the failed Munich Putsch. I can't take power by force. I need to do it legally. Now, here's a guy that's going to work through the system. He'll work through the system to later suborn the system. <laughs> but he's going to work through the system. Uh, well, work for the system. He was still, after the Depression, you know, when you get to the street level, uh, the SA was still taking on the Rock Kampferbahn or Red Fighting in front of the communists. Uh, you know, the beer hall brawls, the alley, so on and so forth. And so after 1929, Germany's degenerating into, into a free-for-all on the streets between the extreme left and the extreme right. Which, if you recall, uh, if you recall Charlottesville in 2017, what did you say? Yeah. And so... You know, Hitler understands this. However, as the, as the successive government, the Heinrich Brunning government of 1930, Franz von Papen's government, 1932, and Kurt von Schleicher's government, late 1932, where, you know, the, the civilian populations aren't working, so you bring a general on to be the chancellor and form a government here? And that didn't work either, because he tried to split the Nazis, and he couldn't. And so, who was, who was going to be asked to be the chancellor? That vulgar little corporal from Austria, as Paul von Hindenburg at one point used to call him, the vulgar corporal. And so Hitler will be brought on and be chancellor. Now keep in mind here again, you know, there, uh, he didn't have the government that he wanted at this point, but he does have the chancellorship. And out of, and out of the various government portfolios here, he does have, he does have uh, you know, Mr. Frick, in charge of the, of the Ministry of Interior. That's the police, security. You want that one. And Hermann Goering is a minister without portfolio, but he's there. And so the, what's gonna happen with the Reichstag fire? Uh, you know, it's on February 26, the day after. The day after, President Paul von Hindenburg signs a decree here for the protection of German citizenry. Well, what does that allow the Nazis to do? consolidate their hold on government because the Enabling Act is going to be passed in late March 1933. And here you begin to see a crackdown on the press, freedom of expression. And some historians, and they have a leg to stand on here, uh, look at the Reichstag fire and the Enabling Act in Nazi Germany in 1933, and then they look at what happened with 9-11 and then the Patriot Act that followed. I mean, you're going to tell me within a month to five weeks that five, six hundred page document, the Patriot Act, was written in a month? That must have been sitting on the shelves collecting dust for a while. 
Uh, anyone here ever read that thing? Interesting piece of legislation. Uh, interesting piece of legislation. And so you, you see, in, in a, and, I, and, I, and I've mentioned this in other talks too, I don't know if I mentioned it here, but when you go through the Christian epic, go through the Christian epic, more often than not, you know, Christians and the, and the idea of the Prince of Peace, they usually eschew that after a while and latch on to an authoritarian or a despot. Happens many times in Christian society. And so the idea of Christianity being the be-all, end-all, uh, no, 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 let's grow up, doesn't it? That's not the case. Wasn't the Soviet Union, uh, you know, Russia, did, was the, what, weren't they Eastern Orthodox? Isn't that Christian? Yeah. Uh, Italy, wasn't that fascist? Weren't they Catholics? Yeah. Uh, Nazi Germany? Yeah, okay. You know, we can keep going on with this. We can keep going on with this. And so here, but here you see, this is the, the, one of the two of the reasons that Hitler is able to grab power, number one, or keep power, is that number one, it's a single party state. Single party. You know, there's going to be no more Catholic Center Party. There's going to be no more so Social Democratic Party. There's going to be no more Democratic Party. There's going to be no more Communist Party to speak of. And the other aspect here. Hitler's going to take the office of president and chancellorship, meld them together in August 1934, and what do you have? Fuhrer. We're done. No more representative government. It's over. It's finished. But what happens from here? There had to be some sort of ruling clique. There had to be, there had, there had to be some, so, some sort of government, and there will be. However, despite the fact that Hitler seems to have unlimited power. Un I mean, even the army at this point, you know, af af after Hindenburg dies and Hitler is able to meld or bring together the chancellorship and president, presidency and, and the chancellorship, you know, the army is going to, his army is going to, their oath of allegiance goes to who? Hitler. Interesting how Hitler, interesting how Hitler uh, organizes this. You know, the army the army, the big, big businessmen in the army, or the armed forces, collude with Hitler. Yeah, we'll bring him on in lieu of the communists in, in January 1933, but we are hiring him. Yeah, how'd that work out? We are hiring him. And yet, after they tell him, you know, the, the night of the long knives, uh, Jan June 30 to July 1, 1934, because even though Hitler had power, even though he was given the chancellorship, and even though he was able to, you know, muzzle the press, muzzle people's rights, and interesting here too, going back to what's going to happen to the un labor union movement, that'll be, co that'll be coming to an end. And I'll get into a little bit of that later on. You know, here he and he's going to stop in June, July, 30, July 14, 1933. There'll be no other political parties. The Nazi Party is the only party allowed. And yet, after he acquiesces to the uh, to big business, the big bankers, and the armed forces, you got to get rid of Rum because Ernst Rum was chief of the S.A., the S.A., the Sturm ob Tielung. And by 1934, he had three million men in the S.A. Three million men. And Rum is saying, yeah, this is how we're going to spread national socialism across borders. He's sounding like a Trotskyite, for crying out loud. You know, and, and yes, and, and, and another gripe the S.A. had, recall I said last week that the S.A., the, the gripe they had, that yes, Hitler is now commiserating with the, with the, with the army generals and the, and the admirals and the big businessmen and the big bankers. We're the ones that did the fighting for him in the streets. You know, this is almost like the common man getting it stuck to him again. And so what's Rum saying? We are the ones that did the fighting and we're the ones being forgotten here. In fact, he will write, and I have this pamphlet, it's an interesting pamphlet to read, written by Ernst Rum, Na the National Socialist Revolution and the SA. And he writes here, he actually writes, this is how we spread national socialism cross borders. Again, he sounds like Trotsky. And that's not, that does not set well with the establishment. And so Rum has got to go. 
and go he will. And not on his own volition either. Two bullets will figure uh, will, will, will do that in a jail cell or in the cell in the Lichterfeld barracks when he's killed. And one of them, I think, who killed him was Theodore Ike, an SS officer who will later be a concentration camp commander. He's, he's a, quite a character, Theodore Ike. And so Hitler takes control, but at the same time, the army, the businessmen, and the bankers want him to get rid of Rum. What did he do? What did Hitler? What was Hitler able to do? Get the army to swear allegiance to him in lieu of Germany, because now, with Hitler, the single-party state, melding together the office of president and chancellorship, now, now, now what happens? Germany is Hitler, Hitler is Germany, and now the army swears allegiance. And I've seen, I've seen a, a, some film clips of this. Interesting, guys in their uniforms and their helmets on, swearing allegiance to Adolf Hitler. Wow. Wow. Interesting here. But then again, even though he has unlimited power, let's take the SS for instance. The SS, that's their, their Magna Carta is the Knight of the Long Knives. Because now they were a minor entity inside the SA. 1926 on. 1934, boy, they, their Magna Carta. And their Magna Carta what? Coup. The SA leadership, they got rid of them. And it's, this thing's going to grow, you know, under the tutelage of Heinrich Himmler, a master bureaucrat, ex-chicken farmer. Himmler was the type of guy who was not in this for the money. He was, a, he was, a ex, he was an excellent bureaucrat, wonderful record keeper. He had files on everybody. You know, you go to move against them, well, we're going to have a discussion here. We're going to have a talk. You pull out a file on you. Master file keeper. That's how you stay in power. That's how you stay in power. You can, boy, how everyone trusts everyone else here. Really. And so, however, but even though Hitler supposedly has unlimited power, can he control, through Himmler, every facet of the SS, especially when it begins to grow? No. No. You can't. But interesting here, because when you look at the SS, Heinrich Himmler, you know, underneath Hitler is Himmler, Reichsführer SS. But then again, you have people like Reinhard Heydrich running the SD. That's going to grow. Arthur Nerby running the Kripo or criminal police. That's going to grow. Heinrich Mueller running the Gestapo. That's going to grow. You know, and, you know, and Oswald Pohl, who's going who's to get his neck stretched at Nuremberg, running the economic aspects of the SS. And that gets you to the concentration camps eventually, you know, where they would take the gold, fill, gold and silver fillings out of the teeth of the dead people and send them to the Reichsbank. Or cut the hair off and use it for whatever they were using it for, stuffing pillows, whatever the case may be. It's a business. It's a business. And they are using the trappings of the Industrial Revolution, capitalism, and technology for this factory, for this process of death. It's a business. And Paul was running it for the SS. But when you get an empire within an empire, it's hard for the leader to keep control of this. But then again, it does work because these people who run these facets of this empire within an empire are creating their own fiefdoms and they know why they are there to serve Hitler and then to serve themselves. Screw the German people or the German nation. That's what it leads to. And so when you think of people who voted for Hitler or supported Hitler because he's going to change, he's going to, he's going to improve their lot. Really? Is that a warning? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Interesting here, though. Interesting here. Hans Frank, uh, 1938, defines, really, the head of the Nazi Association of Lawyers and Academy, Hitler's, Hitler's mode of power. Get a load of this. One, at, 
And this is, this is actually part of German law here, the Academy of German Law. At the head of the Reich stands the la leader of the NSDAP, National Socialist German Workers' Party, as the leader of Germany for life. Note that, the last, last, last few words here, for life. If you recall not all that long ago, not all that long ago, what did Xi Jinping, was it, what was he able to do in China in 2018? Unlimited term, who said that? Yeah, unlimited terms in China. He's president for life. President for life. And yet, what did you hear coming out of the Oval Office here? Gee, that's great, we ought to try that here. Yeah, that's what he said. We ought to try that here. No, I don't think so. He's a dictator looking for a place to happen. <laughs> two, number two. He is, on the strength of being, of being leader of the NSDAP, leader and chancellor of the Reich. As such, he embodies simultaneously head of state, supreme state power, and as chief of the government, the central functions of the whole Reich administration. He is the head of state and chief of the government in one person. He is commander in chief of the armed forces of the Reich. That's Xi Jinping in China right now. He's commander in chief of the armed forces, president for life. That's what Stalin was. Although, Unlike Hitler, uh, the argument comes up here that, you know, that we, we bandy it. There, now, there's a good talk. What is totalitarianism? You know, Hitler was the Fuhrer. I'll give you that. But really, was he a real totalitarian? That, that, that's been a discussion among historians and political scientists for years. Dictator? Yeah. Totalitarian? And some have said the same thing about Mussolini, who's a totalitarian, another dictator. But if anyone is the, if, you know, in a dictionary, the term, a definition for a totalitarian, you know whose picture should be there? Stalin. Right next to it. Stalin had such a hold because of what? Unbridled fear. Remember, there was supposedly in Russia, 1942, I think it was, he was walking along uh, on a cold day, you know, coat on, and he's walking along. And I think he had his pipe, and I think he was smoking his pipe. And I think it was Vyacheslav Molotov he's walking with, and he's in a very pensive mood. Um, gee, all the comrades we came up with, all the comrades, Tomsky and uh, Zinoviev and... Rattling off all these names, and, and Molotov's not saying a word. <laughs> and, you know, shaking his head, looking down at the snow as they're walking, and then all of a sudden, made a rotten hell. Yeah, Stalin. Uh, he's, <laughs> wow, something. Three, the Fuhrer. The microphone, oh, here it is. The Fuhrer and Reich Chancellor is the constituent delegate, now notice the terminology here, constituent delegate, of the German people who without regard for formal preconditions decides the outward of the Reich in its structure and general policy. Constituent delegate. Now, you elect people to Congress, right? Aren't you part of the constituency? Aren't they supposed to cater to that constituency? No, well, that's what's supposed to happen. Here, constituent delegate. Hitler is the constituent delegate, not just for something like a fourth district here, for 70 million Germans. For 70 million Germans. That's a big district. That's a big district. Constituent delegate. But for what? For what? Is he really representing his interests or his own? Or for those who came along on the coat, you know, on, the, on, on his coat, coattails here. 
Interesting how this is. Constituent delegate. Note the word here. Note the terminology. For the Fuhrer is supreme judge of the nation. Now get this. There is no position in the area of constitutional law in the Third Reich independent of, of this elemental will of the Fuhrer. He can override the courts. Talk about unbridled power here. And that comes out of uh, a book called Nazism. This is a pretty good book, by the way. Uh, it's a two-volume set on documents and, and written, written missives from the Third Reich. Wow. Unbridled power. And so this gets us to really talking about power. How about the Reich community itself? Something known as the Volksgemeinschaft. Or English translation, the folk community. Now, you know, Georg Hegel, the, and I, you've heard me mention Hegel before, because he's a pronounced philosopher. This is a man who looked at philosophy, but from the, but from, from, from the perspective of history. Hegel said the modern state, the modern state is the highest endeavor of a nation, of the people, a state. The people are here, the state is here. That's the highest endeavor, is the state. And people serve that state. And one of the greatest examples of people serving the state is coming to its defense. They are one of a part of many. In other words, you lose your identity here. You lose your identity. It's the state. And of course, Mussolini, in putting together the corporate fascist state, obviously goes along with that. Where the corporation is the highest endeavor in a corporate fascist state and the worker is here. The worker exists for the state. Interesting here. However, Hitler differs here. Hitler differs. Fascinating here how, and I want to get to the right, let me see here. This is what, number Right, number three, Hitler. Because I've got Mein Kampf right here. Hitler, though, doesn't believe in the state. Hitler takes Hegel's idea, and what does Hitler say? And he writes this in Mein Kampf. In general, it should not be forgotten that the highest aim of human existence is not the preservation of the state, let alone the government, but the preservation of the species. Hmm. If the species is in, it itself is in danger of being oppressed or utterly eliminated, the question of legality is reduced to the subordinate role. Then, even if the methods of the ruling power are alleged to be legal a thousand times over, nonetheless, the oppressed people's instinct of self-preservation remains the loftiest justification of their struggle for, uh, with every weapon. Only through recognition of this principle have wars of liberation against internal and external enslavement of nations on this earth come down to us in such majestic historical examples. In other words, human law cancels out state law. And Hitler ends by saying, the world is not for cowardly peoples. Neither is old age. <laughs> well, well, in other words, it's the struggle of peoples. That's the highest, in the highest form of a people, to exist, to defeat, and to defeat the lesser breeds as pollutants, contaminants to the blood. Here, yeah, somebody just said, here we go. Yeah, Walter Deray, blood and soil, which Heinrich Himmler is going to gravitate towards. Blood and soil, written in 1931 by Walter Deray, some half-baked moron theorist, who the Nazis are going to go with. You know, 
the, the lesser breeds need not, need not apply. However, having said that, the lesser breeds need to be purged. And you know where this is going. People who are afflicted with something known as inferior genes. Gypsy, Slavs, Jewish people. You need to reinforce the strain. And so unlike Hegel, where collectively perhaps, collectively perhaps, the state is the highest form of endeavor? No. Preservation of the species is. The world is not for cowardly peoples. That's Hitler. Yet at the same time here, interesting here, the philosophy of Nazism then underscores the notion of the Aryan. And so to, and so to the Aryanization of the German race, you need to purge such pollutants to blood. And so the Nazi state, to a large extent, is based on racial hygiene. Getting rid of, and these are terms that come out of this, useless eaters. How do you like that terminology? Useless eaters. This is Nazism. This is Nazism. But however, Hitler's, Hitler's, the real limerick for Hitler here is, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. One people, one republic, one leader. You know, and I've seen a number, a number of Hitler's speeches. And in a few of them, uh, you know, Rudolf Hess follows. You know, the lackey here, the lapdog. And after one of these speeches, I mean, Hitler, his shirt is, is wet. You know, he's got to mat his hair back down. He's got the crowd up. And well, well who, who follows? Rudolf Hess, you know, for that last gasp here, you know, to get the people to get up on their feet and they're raising their arms and, and Hess, in, you know, is screaming here, you know, Adolf Hitler, you know, the Fuhrer of the Third Reich, Hitler is Germany, Germany is Hitler, Sig Heil, and everyone's up there going Sig Heil, Sig Heil, Sig, I mean, it's a mass hysteria here, collectively, you know, col a collective, you know, they've got these people right where they want them. I was watching a clip not long ago, a, a man's very old at this point, and he was a very, very young, teen, still a teenager, uh, well, older teen, getting ready to go to college, I guess, and he said he saw a few of Hitler's speeches, and he said, you know, he said he was going through all the nonsense he usually spewed, but he said, you know something, even if you know some of us knew this was nonsense, it was attractive, it, the, the attractive nature of the rallies to take part. You didn't want to be left out. And you wind up seeing that you're, you're seeing yourself, you're now involved in this. Even though you know it's nonsense. It's total nonsense. Wow. Yet Hitler, again going back to um, the, you know, the party being an entity of 70 million people, again, it must, be, it must be understood here, too. Again, we refer to Mein Kampf here in organizing people. Uh, and this is what Hitler stated in Mein Kampf. The NSDAP, National Socialist German Workers' Party, must not become the constable of public opinion. Get a load of this. Constable of public opinion, but must dominate it. Dominate it. It must not become the servant of the masters, ma the masses, but their master, to which he adds, that all great world-shaking events have been brought about not by the written word, but by the spoken word. And Hitler states in Mein Kampf again, that the capacity of the masses to forget is phenomenal. Wow! Talk about somebody who understood how to mold the mind here, collectively. It's almost like Edward Bernays, uh, that, that man who was able to, uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, who was, came here. Uh, he was a very young man when he came here. His mother was married to Sigmund Freud, his mother Anna. And before the First World War, he was a publicist for opera singers, many of them female opera singers, but one of his clients was huh, uh, uh, um, Anton, uh, uh, Caruso. 
and he was hired by the Creel Commission, George Creel, in World War I to be part of the uh, Committee for Public Information. Now here's where America's changing here too. Organizing American opinion for the war. And when the war is over with, Bernays was saying, well gee whiz, if this stuff works in wartime, can it work in peacetime? And in 1922-23, he opens up an office of public relations in New York City. And he will get millions of women hooked on cigarettes for Chesterfield and then Lucky Strike. George Washington Hill saw his cigarette sales beginning to do with this because Bernays was at Chesterfield, so he bought Bernays and all of a sudden his cigarette sales are going like this. And to get women mobilized to smoking, you know, they got the right to vote in 1920. And so what does Bernays do? In 1928-29, he has a campaign with Lucky Strikes, uh, with Lucky Strike. And he, had the, and, he, and he was one of these that came up with this idea. You've probably seen this maybe in a, a you know, uh, a old Life magazine uh, at a, uh, issue. Or one of those Life magazines where they go back in time and there was a woman, attractive, a slender woman in a slinky red dress with a cigarette between her fingers and she has this far away look. And the caption, one of the captions in one of these photos was uh, cigarettes, torches of freedom. Yeah. And the Nazis wanted Bernays. He writes a book in 1928, by the way. A one, one word title, Propaganda. And Bernays states, interesting here when you look at the Nazis, what Bernays writes in this book, that in, in, in the modern, go, note this, the modern democratic state, people vote, people go to the polls and vote for people who think are representing their interests. Little do they know, little do they know that that is not what's really happening. They are, their, 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 their tastes are molded, their, 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 their decisions are made for them, and their minds are molded by people they don't even know exist. They can't see them. You know, like the Wizard of Oz, don't look at the man behind the curtain here. The man who molds the opinion, our opinions are people like Bernays. Because Bernays states in this book, you know, in this country at the time, maybe 100, 110 million people, you can't have people going in 100, 110 million different directions. If you want a unified nation, you have to, you have to narrow the menu and get people to go in a few directions. Wow. Interesting here. Fascinating. Fascinating. And the Nazis wanted Bernays, and Bernays told them no. He told them no. In fact, Nixon wanted Bernays, and Bernays told him no. He was born in 1892, died in 1995. Yeah. Edward Bernays. And no, he had nothing to do with the sauce. <laughs> Every time I give a talk on Bernays, somebody in the back, they have anything to do with the sauce? No, the name is not even spelled. It's B-E-R-N-A-Y-S. Edward Bernays. His uncle was Sigmund Freud, and he used to call Uncle Sigmund up. Hey, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? Interesting what's coming out of this period here. It's fascinating to see. Fascinating to see. But anyway, Hitler then was an opportunist slash propagandist. That's what he was. Knew how to mold the mind and then take advantage of it. I mean, he'll organize a whole country and go to war and people will go, will willingly go. Now keep in mind here, his leadership style, and I have here, had little use, had little use for elections. On March 5, 1933, really one of the last bona fide elections in Germany, on March 5, 1933, the Catholic Center Party got 4.4 million votes. That translated into 74 seats in the Reichstag. The Social Democrats, 7.1 million votes, 120 seats in the Reichstag. And we're still the largest non-Nazi party. The ranks of the communists had shrunk by a million, but at that time they were able to get 4.8 million votes. That translated into eight, 81 seats. 
even after he was chancellor in this election, the Nazis got 17.2 million votes, 288 seats. That's still less than 50% of the, the Reichstag. That's 44%, that's 44 of the Reichstag. But they were able to maintain a plurality because of another rightist party, the National Fr People's Party, which got 3.1 million votes, 52 seats. And so some of these initiatives that were got to be passed in favor of the Nazis, they got the extra vote from the National People's Party, another right-wing party, which went with the Nazis. And so the last vestiges of democratic government, the Weimar Republic or representative government, die here in 1933. Of course, you know it's over in August of 1934 after Hindenburg dies and Hitler is able to put the office of the president and chancellery in one office known as Fuhrer. Now, interesting here too, uh, and I did some, this is fascinating research. Hitler's run, Hitler, how did Hitler rule? It's kind of complex, but then again, there's a simplicity to it. Keep in mind here, the first year, the first year he's chancellor, in the Reich chancellery, 72 gatherings of ministers and party hacks where they discuss what they're going to do about Germany, right? 72 meetings. 1934. 1933, we had 72 such meetings. In 1934, 19. 1935, 12. 1936, 4. Gee, we went up a little bit in 1937 with seven of them. But by February 5, 1938, one. What happened to Hitler sitting down with ministers and representatives of the party here? That's not even happening now. And many of these meetings, interestingly enough, many of these meetings which begin with dialogue, interaction between the ministers and Hitler, after a while degenerate into what? Oration by Hitler. What did Hitler say? The spoken word galvanizes the masses. What got him there, he's now using on his ministers. They don't even have to say anything. All they have to do now is sit and listen. That's all they have to do. Is anything being accomplished here? This is where you begin, go back to what I mentioned earlier. This is where you go back to as these different government portfolios or different branches that begin to exist, like the SS. Heinrich Himmler will oversee this for Hitler, but as the, as the, as the SS grows, keep in mind the SS starts with eight bodyguards. Eight bodyguards. <laughs> By the time this is over, they're going to have over a million people. And so this plethora of branches of the SS, which is a branch of the Nazi government. Now there's the sub-branches. And so we don't really have government policy anymore. These, 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 these oh, oh, chancellors, these little chancellors of these fiefdoms within the SS, and that's just one part, the SS, really run their fiefdoms. What happened to, what happened to government in Germany? It's dying. You know, the, the, even, even though representative government is gone, you have the dictator here, who now at this point seems like he's pulling back. And so ardent Nazi prototypes will now run the government. Now we're down to what? No more cabinet meetings. I mean, this is the Fuhrer Princip, the Fuhrerstadt, or the Fuhrer State. After 1937, Hans Lammers. Hans Lammers was, you know, was the Reich minister at the Reich chancellery. So now he's going to, now keep in mind, 1933, 73 gatherings of, of Nazi party hacks and ministers. Now in 1937, we're down to Hitler and Hans Lammers discussing this stuff. Hans Lammers was the go-between for all these ministers. You know, the ministers would give them what, the, you know, give Lammers maybe pieces of legislation or ideas, things they wanted to get done. Lammers would talk to, to talk to Hitler about this. Now we're down to two people talking instead of 73. 
See what's happening in Nazi rule here? Uh, they're, they're, you know, now you're having these people in these fiefdoms running their, running their own fiefdoms. Does Hitler even know what's going on? Does he really know what's going on? That's the question here. And so Hitler, Hitler was, and I, I, I find this fascinating. Draft legislation by government ministers required them to forward the same to Lammers, who in turn met with Hitler to discuss such proposals. But Hitler was loath to engage in legislative matters. He found it tediously boring. Now that he has power, what's he doing with it? What's he doing with it? And they call this a functioning state. Jeez. <laughs> And so now, in 1936 to 1939, the four-year plan, and guess who's going to run that? Not an economist, Hermann Goering. Yeah, there's a prescription for success. He's not even an economist. And this convoluted way to try to re resurrect the German economy, but it's going to be resurrected for one thing, folks, one thing only, in the end, war. That's coming. That's coming. But there was no real attempt here to organize where the money's going to be spent, the materials, manpower. Don't you need men in an army? Don't you need men in the Luftwaffe? Don't you need men, don't you need men in the Kriegsmarine, the Navy? Of course you do. But then again, don't you need men in the factories? Especially when you don't want women to work. Oh, what's the status of women? Women are to be barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen. That's really what we're doing here. Even to the extent that at one point, why would you want to educate women and prepare them for college? When they're really, their sole lot in life is to, is to produce good German children. I think I mentioned this before, Heinrich Himmler and his Anenerby homes, where these SS, these prime SS men, you know, the virile, the virile German SS man was supposed to mate up with, with competent women, and hopefully these women would produce more than, well, more than one child per episode here. In fact, they, they had medals. If you, if you were a woman and you produced two children, you got a medal. If you, got, if you produced three, you got a different medal. If you produced four, you got a different medal. You know, they got it more elaborate as they go along here. And Heinrich Himmler, that, that ex-chicken farmer, thought that the Scottish people were an example of a virile, virile Nordic type. And they got that way by eating porridge. Now, who the hell figured that one out? Where is the scientific proof of that? And so, you know, these women who have been impregnated by, by these S, virile SS types are now being fed porridge. The only thing they're going to get is fat. Didn't work. It didn't work. You know, in the words of Ed Norton, another good idea, Ralph, that's gone to pot. <laughs> I mean, is, is this what happens when you have a government like this? Christmas, it's unbelievable. But, and as this goes along, interesting, I, I put here, I put here, such empires within the Nazi state, these, these convoluted uh, branches that, that, that spring up, like the Hitler Youth. The Hitler Youth, Balder von Schirach runs that. And even here, too, one that, one that had some, some sort of uh, semblance of, of, of having their heads on right was the Tote Organization. The Tote Organization, Fritz Tote. Uh, this was an organization to organize the economy for war. And Fritz Tote, Fritz Tote didn't want a bureaucracy of Wehrmark bureaucrats, no, bu uh, bureaucrats from the armed forces. He wanted actual economists and people who knew how to run an economy to run the German economy. That's what he wanted. And when Germany goes to a war, Germany really didn't go to a wartime economy, folks, until February 1942. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. Hitler still, there was slack to be taken up in the German economy. 
In fact, after the defeat of France in, in June 1940, Hitler cut back on arms production. We still have to make civilian goods for the German people or else they're going to bolt. Ah, now he's stuck in that game. And even in the fall of 1941, at the height of the invasion of the Soviet Union, when it looked like the Soviets were going to be defeated, again he cut back on arms production. And to give you an example, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, the, the army, 3,580 tanks among 19 Panzer divisions. 3,580 tanks. The Soviets had 22,700. Now you're probably thinking, well, how were the Germans able to pull this off? Superior tactics, superior leadership, and control of the air by the Luftwaffe. In fact, in two battles at Minsk and Smolensk on the Russian front, the Soviets lost 6,000 tanks. 6,000 tanks. And so, they were still producing civilian goods. Germany was armed for breadth, not depth. As long as the campaigns were quick, we're fine. Once we get stuck in a long war of attrition, uh, then it's not so good. And that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. You know, and it gets, the situation is going to get worse here. <laughs> In 1941, another, another piece of the government that's going to be created here, another branch. Really, for one man. That's what this is called. Staff of the Fuhrer's Deputy. This was changed in 1941 to party chancellery. And guess who that will be? Martin Bormann. Bormann will have such power. He was an opportunist. He was, he was, he was, uh, ex, you know, he had un, unbridled ambition, Martin Bormann. And Bormann's even going to, it's even going to get to the extent that Bormann's going to determine who sees Hitler and who doesn't? Well, what happened to Hans Lammers representing various, various government ministries? What happened to him? You know, as you can control who sees the Fuhrer, how much power do you have? A lot. A lot. And so we go from having 73 meetings, 72 meetings in 1933, with Hitler and his various ministers, now down by 1942, having one man to determine who sees him and who doesn't. What kind of government is this? Party control. That's what this is. Government doesn't control the country. The party does. This is what happens when you have a single party. Contro this is the same sort of thing that happened in Iraq with Saddam. Stalin? Let's, th let's throw Stalin in here. One strong man at the head of a party. But then again, isn't the strong man the party? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Interesting here, too, when you go into this. Eh. And of course, you want to really get down to this. British Garden. The Berghoff. Ober Salzburg, Hitler's hideaway, which was 1,700 feet up in the Bavarian Alps to the extent that he could see his homeland, Austria. He's not German, you know, he was Austrian. Not that it really makes much difference here. Hitler came to spend more and more time at the Berghof, Ober Salzburg, near the town of Berchtesgaden. Hitler's mountain retreat, some 1,700 feet up in the Bavarian Alps. The Fuhrer's grandiose redoubt was within line of sight of his Austrian homeland and provided that tonic of escape from the big city, Berlin. And the people he never much cared for in the first place anyway. Hitler's notion of leadership was fulfilled in the guise of voluminous rooms, thick carpets, kitchens, 
bedrooms, food and wine cellars, a cavernous banquet hall, and with a plethora of underground floors and guard rooms. A grand reception room boasted a massive rectangular banquet table and a picture window akin to a movie screen. All was encircled by five rings of fortifications and barracks enough for thousands of troops. Climbing atop the 13 floors was Hitler's tower, complete with an elevator to the, and this is what some people used to call the place, the eagle's nest. And Hit, where Hitler would sometimes perch and revel in beloved solitude. And of course, I added here, this monument to fascism was brought about by Hitler himself with funds earned from sales of Mein Kampf. Indeed, British Garden was that Miralago of Nazi Germany. <laughs> what happened to this thing called the Nazi government? What happened to Hitler really being the totalitarian here? No. People like Heinrich Himmler, Hermann Goering, Joseph Goebbels, Balder von Schirach, people like this are running their fiefdoms. What happened to government in Germany? There's your government. These Nazi party hacks running their fiefdoms. And Hitler spending more and more time at Bertischgarten. Yeah, you go into Berlin. But he's spending more and more time at Bertisch Garden. I've made it to hell. Although he did spend a lot of time as the war goes on um, with, the, with, the, with the generals. And in particular, after June 22nd, 1941, he spent more and more time with the Eastern Front. That was his baby. Because if you read Mein Kampf, the reason for the war in the first place was the Eastern Front. That's where the goodies were. That's, you know, what did, what did Hitler get when he took France and the Low Countries? Wood, wine, and people? Big deal. You go east. Coal, manganese, tungsten, iron ore. How about oil? How about Ukraine as a breadbasket? The wheat, the livestock. Hmm. Yeah. But it doesn't work in the end. And so Hitler is an example of when people put too much faith in one person as that savior, messiah, the fuhrer, the dictator, whatever you want to call him. It never works in the end. It never does. And who takes it on the chin in the end? The people. This shouldn't be a surprise here. Anybody have any questions or comments here? Yes. Yeah, Hitler, Hitler gave, on the way up gave them what they wanted in the end. Uh, you go back to 1918. Um, you know, the Allies, the Allies made a big mistake by not totally occupying Germany. Uh, not like they will in 1945. They will. They'll divide it into districts. Um, they also, the Allies also made a mistake, I think, and uh, you know, some other historians have said the same thing, but I think they made a mistake by not pressing their claims to do away with the general staff, which was a veritable institution in Germany. And that general staff, uh, you know, by not totally occupying Germany, uh, they'll occupy portions of it, but not all of it. And, and so when the Allies don't invade Germany, as Marshal Foch at one time threatened to do, if they didn't come to a, an understanding and sign the armistice, if they, if, you know, to prevent an Allied invasion of, of, of Germany proper, uh, you know, the army is, the army is, is going to push uh, this new government, you know, they're going to sign an armistice. The army won't sign it. The new government will, this Republican government. And so the army is going to say, we didn't lose the war. We were stabbed in the back at home by socialists, communists, uh, Democrats, and, and the Jews. And so many Germans are going to believe this. 
They have no government anymore to speak of. Their economy is shattered. The troops are coming home. And the army really was defeated. But people will believe this because they have nothing else to believe. You know, many men are going to join these Fry Corps groups, these paramilitary groups, which in the end are supported by the army. And so they will be fighting on the, you know, they're going to be fighting on the eastern frontier of Germany to protect it from the Poles. These are people who are doing this. These are, un, you know, cashiered soldiers, guys out of work. They have nothing else to do. But then at the same time, they're going to be used to crack down on the communists. And Hitler, at the same time as he's rising to power here, is saying, we are going to get that territory back. We lost to Versailles, like the Polish corridor separating Germany from East Prussia and Danzig. Uh, and, he's going to, and he's going to say, uh, we are going to militarize the Rhineland, which, according to Versailles, Germany couldn't militarize 50 kilometers from the French border. And so the idea of a Germany coming back resonates with Hitler, who in turn will be able to resonate with many of the people. And he will, and then when the depression strikes, you know, at, at, you know what's, happening to, what's happening to the German economy? And so people, when they think they have no recourse, will go with somebody who's going to promise them the moon. And there are going to be factions in the economy and in the political, in the political structure you know, who are to the right who aren't going to go with the communists. They're going to go with Hitler. And so Hitler delivers. Hitler begins to deliver. You know, he begins to rebuild the German economy. Public works programs. The auto bonds for one. Right. But then again, you know, we're in the 19th century going into the First World War where one of the major engines of transport for the German army was the, were the railroads. We are now in that era of the internal combustion engine. Ah, cars and trucks. And so what do they do? They make sure a lot of these autobahns go from east to west and back again. Why is that? Trucks and tanks. Just like the railroads. <laughs> And Hitler builds the autobahns. And so it seems like he's resurrecting the economy. Okay, we can do this. And he's going to get help. Wall Street, for one. He will. He'll get help from American banks. 1938, Prescott Bush, that fascist flirting banker, <laughs> will be laundering money for the Nazis. Union Bank. Union Bank. Not the only one. And so, yes, it works for a while. And these short, sharp wars, he's bringing back German self-respect. Of course, he's going to take it to an extra, you know, but before, night, before Poland, what does he do? He, he gets Austria readmitted with the Reich. That's in violation of Versailles. The Sudetenland, with two or three million German-speaking people, has now been severed from Czechoslovakia and applied to the Reich. You know, he's able to do this. And, yeah, okay, he's bringing back our self-respect, and Germans are going to go along with this. They're going to go, and, you know, and, and again, that's the age-old question. How could a country of such intelligent people, right, go with this? And they're going to give up representative government for this. <laughs> But keep in mind, and, and, I'm, and I'm convinced that this is, this, is, this is a truism, that representative government didn't have a track record in Germany. Because when the Hohenzollerns, you know, with, the, with Imperial Germany, that's a monarchy. The Kaiser. Is that a form of representative government? No. And so when, when Otto von Bismarck helped to put together Germany, Sure, you got, the, you got the monarch here, and keep in mind the Industrial Revolution, big businessmen and bankers, you've got the workers and the peasants. However, Bismarck was clever enough to understand here that sure, the monarchy can sit up here, big businessmen and big bankers are going to be privileged, but at the same time, you better throw something to the people here or this whole thing's going to collapse. So what, unemployment insurance, retirement, so on and so forth. Where do you think the Roosevelt administration got some of this from? They, consult, they consulted what Bismarck did. That's what they did. 
And so, but however, at the same time, at the same time, while Bismarck is organizing the state, this, you know, you have a Reichstag and you can vote for representatives, but who has the final say in the end? Kaiser Wilhelm II, he's an absolute. So what happened to bona fide representative government? It doesn't exist. And again, too, with the Kaiser, you had a military coup, August 29, 1916, a silent coup it's called. And the general staff has a virtual military dictatorship in Germany. That's not a form of representative government. And then, and then just prior to the armistice, when Germany is collapsing, and on November 9, all the political parties meet, we're trying to form a government here so, so, you know, so we can function. Frederick Ebert leans out the window to the people outside waiting to find out what kind of government they're going to have, and he says, we're a republic. How'd you get to that? Was there a vote? Where's the Constitution? There's nothing concrete to back up a system of representative government. And so really, in the end, it's not surprising here, especially, especially with the British, and I hold the British and the French culpable for this. If the British, if this war was fought for democracy, I'm talking the First World War, if this war was fought for democracy, as Woodrow Wilson said it was, which is a lot of bunk, if this war was fought for democracy, then how come the British and the French, if you didn't want a war in the future, how come they didn't support representative government in Germany? They don't. All they want is what? Especially the French. They don't support representative government. That was, a, they shot themselves in the foot. Yes. It went in, uh, after the First World War or during the Depression? When Hitler came in, the, the, the one of every three German workers was on the streets. That's 33%. It was high. So again, who are people going to support? Hitler. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And of course, again with Hitler, go back to that March 1933 vote. Yeah, they only got 40, they got 44% of the seats in the Reichstag. The Reichstag. But the National People's Party, another sub-right party, will push them over the edge to get what they want passed. There were still enough people with guts who were social democrats, Catholic Center and Democratic Party who weren't going to go with the Nazis. But what's going to happen to them? Some of them are going to be rounded up and put into the new concentration camps for re-education. Yes. The Gestapo was, uh, if you want to use a rough equivalent, their version of the FBI. It's a secret police. They did internal security. Uh, you know, when Himmler drew up the SS, um, you had you had the Gestapo, you also had the SD or Seischer Heindienst. That was external security. That was party external security. And they were at odds at many times with the Abwehr, which was military intelligence. And the Seischer Heindienst or SD, you could always tell if you see an SS uniform and you see a diamond on it with SD, that's what that is. And that was run by Reinhard Heydrich. And you also had the Kripo, or criminal police, run by a guy named Arthur ne ne Nebbe. And so Himmler, Himmler was able to grab all the different police forces in Germany and put them under the SS umbrella. That's power. That's power. You had a right to be afraid. In fact, later on in the 1950s, uh, when the CIA helps the Shah put together the Sabak in Iran, some of that was based off of the Gestapo. Yeah, uh, again, the SS is a state within a state here. A lot of power here. A lot of power. Anybody else have any questions or, or, or comments? Well, he, he, was, he was the Fuhrer. He attained, he attained that. Right. But he's got the, the crown, the law. Right. Does he have anything other than just personal satisfaction? Uh, anything else to show for it? Yeah. Oh, he, was still, he was still very much an inadequate person. Yeah, but how did an inadequate person come up with all these concepts which were pretty, pretty intense? Yeah, they were. Well, it goes back to the first time perhaps he, he, he when he first German Workers Party meeting he went to in September of 1919 when he was still in the army 
and his job was to go to these different party meetings, attend the meeting, and then report to the army you know, these parties. Well, what's this party about? Does it have any chance to move ahead, whatever the case may be? And also, Hitler was an education officer. Well, the streets, the streets, really. And when he went to that first meeting, ah, this, this party's not going anywhere. And there weren't that many people there, the German Workers' Party. And when he left, that one a college professor got up and lambasted the German Workers' Party for ardent nationalism, racism, and Hitler was at the door getting ready to go, and he heard this college professor turns around and walks back, mounts the rostrum and starts speaking. And holy mackerel, I found what I want to do. He did. In fact, when he left the meeting, he was still, but then again, uh, you know, he'll say, well, you know, this party doesn't look like it's going anywhere but I can mold it for me, and he'll go back. And that's exactly what he's going to do. And almost immediately, he's on the party executive committee with membership number seven. And he's the one that's going to be, you know, he's going to change that. He's going to be one of those that changes the name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and it becomes highly nationalistic. And here he's going to meet people like Ernst Rumm. Eventually, Heinrich Himmler, Rudolf Hess, Goebbels, so on and so forth. And then it just takes off from there. But then again, once, you know, it, it's the struggle. Once you've attained that height, uh, what happened to the struggle? Isn't that, what was the, isn't that, that the exciting part, the struggle? The top of the mountain, yeah, where, where, how high can we go here? No, we wind up in the eagle's nest by ourselves, looking over at the homeland here. You know, that's, that's, yeah, yes, and then I'll move over. Yes. No, Ernst Rumm was. No, Ernst Rumm uh, was the... Well, some people say he was. I honestly don't know. Ernst Rumm was. Hitler, Hitler, um, but Ernst Rumm was chief of the SA. And while that turned off many people who were prim and proper, for a long time, Hitler could care less. He, he, he got the job done, I guess. Oh, you know, Hitler, Hitler, but did Hitler have a real problem with women? I mean, four women commit suicide over him. I don't know why you want to commit suicide over that guy for. He was very much, um, he got to be a so-called vegetarian. He, um, he wasn't a big drinker, if at all. Um, he was an interesting person in that regard. Um, he... He, he really wasn't, you know, he was wedded to power as a, you know, his, use the right word here, was power, not women. He was not like Joseph Goebbels. Goebbels was a womanizer. Yet he's going to have, a, he's going to have Magda and six kids. But, yeah, he, um. He, he was known as an ardent womanizer, Goebbels was. Yeah, he was one of the few that was really college educated among the Nazis. He went to seven universities. Um, another one was, um, oh, what was his name? Goering really wasn't, forget Himmler, he was a chicken farmer. Um, Albert Speer was another one who was extremely intelligent. Speer will take over the Tote organization after Fritz Tote died in that plane crash, and he'll run the wartime economy. Uh, but, you know, Speer comes along too late to really do Hitler any good as far as the war goes. Uh, but he was one of those intelligent types. But then again, you're, you're, you're with a man like Hitler, so how, how, how effective is your intelligence going to be? Because he's not going to trust you anyway. Well, you can see where he's going uh, when the war first starts. Hitler, Hitler would allow generals and admirals to put forth policies and, implement, and many times implement them. When he got to the Eastern Front, that was his baby. And he began to impart more and more authority here, even to the extent of firing great commanders. Like when they didn't beat the Russians at Moscow, December of 41, he fires 36 generals, one of them Heinz Guderian. <laughs> if I had Guderian, I'd, want, I'd, I'd promote him to 10-star general if I had my way. 
uh, because he knew armor. And uh, he'll bring them back, he'll bring them back, but uh, you know, the, the, on the Eastern Front, this is where Hitler really comes alive here with the war. This was his baby, right. And um, you know, at, at Stalingrad, uh, Stalingrad, of course, part of the reason for Stalingrad is the name, Stalingrad, city of Stalin. So then it begins to be an ego trip. It, it, you know, uh, and, and, and even when, uh, when Franz Halder, the German, the German army chief of staff, warns Hitler, uh, you know, we are taking men from the north and the south along the, along the line and feeding them into this inferno, and he tells Hitler it's only going to be a matter of time before we're going to have a problem here and the Soviets will counterattack. And Hitler, Hitler fired him. And he brings in a man, he brings in another general um, who states, two weeks, states the same thing. And, and what's going to happen? Yeah, they, we, they, they took German, because at one point, 20,000 German troops a week were being used up in Stalingrad. 20,000 a week. And they're filling in the empty spots on the line north and south of Stalingrad with Italians, Hungarians, Romanians. Yeah, there's a prescription for success. And when the Russians finally counterattack north and south and they surround the city, you know, Hitler's going to blame his generals. And a quarter of a million German troops will be surrounded. And by the time it's over with, only, only 92,000, including officers, will go into the captivity and when the war is over with, only 5,000 come home out of an army of 330,000. That's Hitler's fault. Yes. Yeah, Hitler Youth prepared ge young German men for the army in the end. Everyone got in. And German women, the League of German Maidens. Yeah, in fact, there's a lady that every once in a while she comes here, but she goes to all the talks I give up, up at the Weston Senior Center. She's, she's uh, 89, 90 now. And she showed me a picture of her in the League of German Maidens in that khaki uniform. And oh, yeah, it was almost like a, a teenage version of the Girl Scouts, I guess. And everyone, you know, was to get, you did things together. That's the thing, you did things together. And a lot of it was calisthenics. You know, we gotta, we gotta be in shape here to create that virile race. Uh, well, you know, um, I mean, at, at, the, the, the Nazis took over the school system. And so, you know, they were, there was an accent on German history. Maybe less on science, you know. And you see where they're going here? And then you spent five hours a day, four or five hours a day in calisthenics and exercise in school. Now, I, now to me, yeah, is, is, is gym and recess important for a kid to develop? I think it is. Five hours a day? No, they're preparing people for the, for the army. The Japanese did the same sort of thing. You know, by the time a Japanese kid was 13, he could probably take apart and put back together an Arasaka rifle or a machine gun. You know where a country like this is going. It's not hard to figure it out. You know, it's, but it's, they, you know, you got to do this. To, what happened to individual initiative? You know, everyone does things together. You know, it's all together. It's cohesive. That's the state. That's, 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 the, that's the state. You know, the totalitarian state, the dictator. You know, we're all on the same page. You can't be somebody who thinks different. That's taboo. Yes. Or, and I remember I was saying this at another talk, because at the end of the first, towards the end of the First World War, he was blinded by gas. And he was, he was in the hospital for three weeks. He got his sight back, and so there was a lady in the back said, well, gee whiz, too bad he got his sight back. Oh, yeah. I don't even know what that quarter really thinks of him, but I, yeah, uh, well, you know. But, but, then, but then again, uh, you know, was there that, that harboring of hatred for Jewish, whether he got rejected or not? But I mean, you know, but, but, but again, when, you know, going back to the Eastern Front, and to me this is telling, uh, you know, when the, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, Stalin, uh, you know, I'm the leader here. <laughs> uh, you know, Stalin, you know, no, not one step back. And, 
And, you know, Zhukov, you know, other generals trying to explain to him, we need to retreat, set up a new line, and Stalin's going to learn this. And he's going, to, he's going to listen to some of his generals, believe it or not. Stalin will learn. And Stalin learns something about the military by competent generals. I mean competent guys like Pavel Ramitstrov, Georgi Zhukov, uh, 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 people like this, Nikolai Vatutin. Uh, uh, Ivan Konev, generals like this, who are every bit as competent as Patton, Bradley, so on and so forth. You never heard of them, maybe, but these guys were good. More brutal, perhaps, than American generals, but they were good. They knew, they knew their craft. And Stalin will learn. He'll listen. Although that doesn't say he's not going to play one off against the other. It's to maintain control. He does. But, you know, Georgi Zhukov is the case in point. Zhukov was the one who would really speak his mind, and Stalin would let him get away with it. And the reason he let him get away with it is that Zhukov was usually right. And this is as the war goes on. On the other side of the line, Hitler is asserting his authority more and more and more, and he's becoming harder and harder to deal with, especially when, you know, he's been taking God knows what. Besides that, too. Yeah, Dr. Theodore Morell, that quack. Um, yeah, it's not going very well for German generals on the other side of the line here. Not that it was a garden for Soviet generals. It wasn't. Believe me, it wasn't. Hitler will, Stalin will have 248 generals and admirals shot during the war for incompetence. Yeah. In fact, Stalin will have about 158,000 people shot, uh, soldiers shot altogether. But you have to admit, between the 248 generals and admirals, he had, you know, he was pretty liberal about it. You didn't make the difference if you were a private or a general. If you were incompetent, you were going to get yours. So, yes, they weren't as equipped. Well, they they weren't. They lacked certain things. For example. Uh, Hitler, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier about the economy, not being on a wartime economy. During the war, the Germans will produce a, a, a just under 400,000 motor vehicles. Now compare that to this country producing 2.6 million trucks. And so when Hitler invades the Soviet Union, he'll invade the Soviet Union with 600,000 motor vehicles. Many of them French and Czech types, besides Opals and Mercedes. At the same time, because of the lack of trucks, he's gonna, they're also going to use 625,000 horses. And so if Guderian, again, you, go, you are on to something here. They're, they're, not as they're not as equipped as some people like to think they were. And so if Guderian is making... 40, 50 miles a day in his tanks at one point. How fast, how many miles a day do you think horse-drawn transport is making? 15? 18? Let's be liberal. How about 20? Does that lead a gap between the lead units and the supplies? Yeah. Does that mean the tanks are going to have to stop for the supplies to catch up? Yeah. And keep in mind, again, I don't know if they considered that, I don't know if they really took this into consideration. 95% of Soviet roads then were not paved. What do you think happens after a heavy rain or melted snows? And then the train, the railroad tracks. The railroad tracks in Russia were different, had a different gauge than European gauge. So what do you got to do? You got to rip up the tracks and put down new rails. Yeah, wow is right, yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, it really wasn't conducive to a, a success here. And Hitler expected his army to take the Soviet Union in 17 weeks. That's a lot to ask. They had the boots. No, they had boots. Uh, the, some of the Italian units Mussolini sent had cardboard boots. How is that going to work on a Volga? <laughs> yeah, she is right. Uh, the problem here is the, trans, the transport. And some German soldiers were still in their summer uniforms outside Moscow. And it's 30, 40 below zero. Now, how's that going to work? That's asking a lot. That really is. And so when people like Guderian uh, were asking, why don't we withdraw, shorten the lines, 
solidify what we have, and then resume the attack in the spring? No. And that's how he's getting to be at this point. I want it now. And so, you know, Stalin uh, will uh, let Zhukov command the troops at Moscow, and on the night of December 4 or 5, 1941, Zhukov launches that huge counterattack, and that's going to be a turning point in the war. Uh, with, on, a f with, with, on a front, it, that, that attack will widen on a front of 600 miles, over 600 miles. Imagine an attack like that over 600 miles across. In weather at 40 degrees below zero, wow! Yeah, okay, let's do it. And they do. They do. Yes. And in fact, um, the, Germans will, uh, the Germans will not really press the case after a while on the atomic bomb. Of course, that was the, part of that's the Nazis, their own fault, because that's, not, that's Jewish physics. And how stupid is that? You know, who the heck cares what religion your scientists are practicing. You wanted them to deliver the product, Jewish physics. Although they did have, they did have nerve gas. Uh, they invented it. And that was their weapon of mass destruction and they won't use it. Uh, but you're right, the rockets, the jet planes. But all this comes really too late. Although the Messerschmitt 262, the swept wing fighter they mass produced, that fighter came out in 1942. And Adolf Galan couldn't wait to get his hands on it. And Hitler took a look at it and says, no, I want it, I want it as a bomber. Now you've got to, re to redesign the plane to accommodate bombs here as a fast bomber. And so Galan really doesn't get this plane uh, in numbers that he wants until 1944. <laughs> you blew two years. And you can imagine... You can imagine if they had produced enough of these planes to attack those B-17s, B-24s, Lancasters, and Halifaxes. Yeah, doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, I mean, how, how dumb is this? How dumb is this? So, but again, when you have a dictator, he makes, every, he makes all the decisions, whether they're good or not. Now the whole nation suffers or benefits. That's the chance you take with a dictator. People can say all they want. Well, Congress, you know, bunk. They were developing it. Uh, they'll have the V1. The V2, they're experimenting with it. The V2, they never really... The V2, they'll use, especially against Britain. Uh, but, you know, again, it's, it's, it gets to be too little too late at the end. And they came out with some interesting air flying wing. They had that. Uh, your swept wing bombers and fighters in this country, where do you think the design, the design signatures come from? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, it, it's, yeah, they were ahead of their time in many respects, but by the time these weapons were really produced, or should have been produced, it, w it was getting late in the game here. So, in fact, they do make a plane called the, the, the Junkers, the, um, it was a six-engine bomber. The Junker, two, the Junker 36, 362. And they, 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 they had the 262, which was a four-engine transport bomber. Uh, but they came out with the, the, three, the 362, I think. I'll have, to, I'll, have to look it back. I'll have to look it up tonight. And it was a six-engine plane. And one of, the, in fact, it was almost the size of a B-52. And this thing took off from Monte Marsan, France, in January 1944, flew clear across the Atlantic to 12 miles outside New York City, turned around and made it back to France, over 6,000 miles. They made three of these. And interesting. Wow. But it had no bombs. So if you start loading bombs on this plane, what happens to the, the range? Because now you've got a load to carry, so you're using more fuel. But the fact of the matter is, over 6,000 miles in 1944, not bad. Not shabby. But it, you know, that's it. They, but again, they had some of this stuff, but not mass-produced. Too little, too late. Interesting. Yeah, the, 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 the Tiger, everyone talks about the Tiger, but the best tank, the best tank they made was the Panther. The Panther was the best German tank. It was based off the Russian T-34, 
Uh, it had, it, 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 it didn't have, it, it, you know, like the Tiger had the 88, the Russians will upgun the, the T-34 from a 76 to an 85, uh, but it had a 75 millimeter gun, a high velocity, and it carried over 81 rounds. And it was good off-road or on-road. And it had bugs in the beginning, but once they worked out the bugs, it was the, in fact, there are armored specialists who say, you know, it, was, it wasn't used for long because of the second part of the war, 43 to 45. Yet, there are armor historians who say that was still the best tank in the world until the patent came out in 1953. It was a brilliant piece of work, the Panther. The problem here is, it's like everything else the Germans make. It was sophisticated, and it wasn't for mass production like a Sherman or a T-34. But on a per-tank basis, if I had a choice, that'd be the day I get in a Sherman. Give me a Panther. The Sherman really, the British used to call that the Ronson lighter. Yeah, but there were a lot of them. I mean, they were all, all over like ants, and so was the T-34. Uh, you know, but the T-34, had sloped armor, had a diesel engine to cut down on the fire hazard. Uh, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the smoothest riding vehicle in the world, but this thing's built for peasants and factory workers. What do they know about Duesenbergs, right? And so uh, it could take a hit. And, but I mean, the fit and finish, the paint jobs were lousy, but we're talking, we're talking the Russians, what, what, what do we care? But the thing is about the T-34, if you had a wrench set and a pair of pliers, you'd keep it running 20 years. What's not to like? What's not to like? And so, and they'll build more of those than we will a Sherman's, by the way. The T-34 was the most mass-produced tank in history. Most mass-produced tank in history. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, during the war, um, that's the thing with Lend-Lease here. Uh, you know, uh, we'll build, this country will build 102,371 102, tanks. The Russians will build anywhere from 115 to 121,000. And we will send the Russians over 4,000 Shermans. And you know what the Russians use those for? Training and rear area work, for the most part. And guess what? The Russians wouldn't take them unless we put diesel engines in them. The heck are our guys? Chop liver? Yeah. We had to put diesel, or they wouldn't take them. And they were taking those little, uh, those little uh, M3 Stuarts and the Lees and, you know, those purple heart boxes. But again, they were using them for training or rear area work, that kind of thing. You couldn't use one of those tanks against the Germans. <laughs> it wouldn't work. No, we'll use T-34s for that. That's a man's tank. No. And, uh, and, and, it, and, and we could have had maybe that tank because there was a man called J. Walter Christie, who was an American designer. And he, you know, you know, the tank is undergoing an evolution here like everything else does after the First World War. And he, does, he came up with a suspension for a tank on road, off road, for tanks doing more than 30 miles an hour. And the War Department decided they didn't want it. You know, Christie thought, you know, these, those, those pot belly stoves you saw in the first world, going back to the trenches here, those things that did three or four miles an hour, well, that's not what a tank should be. Tanks should be able to have high speed, have a good gun, and a competent crew, right? Okay, what's wrong with that, if you're into this sort of thing? And so, the Soviets want that suspension. And they will go through various marks of tanks through the 1930s until they come up with the T-34. And that suspension on that T-34 is based off the J. Walter Christie suspension. And what the Soviets did was they put 19-inch wide tracks on this thing. And it could go through almost any terrain that no other tank could go through. What's not to like here? And a diesel engine with a competent gun? It's great. It's great. And it was easy, easier to fix. That's typical Russian. So, but yeah, I mean, the War Department didn't want, so we got the Sherman. 
I know the Sherman has a distinctive design. I'll give you that. I used to love to build it when I was a kid. But then again, I would, you know, when I, I'd build these models, I'd have a Sherman here. I'd take a look at a T-34, and there's the Sherman. It's a wreck. So, interesting. Interesting. I mean, you know, uh, uh, that, but again, typical German, each piece is good. There's not enough of it. There's not enough of it. Typical German, bite off more than you can chew. So, the 88, the gun, the 88. I mean, talk to GIs who fought in World War II. Uh, they'll tell you about the 88. <laughs> yeah. It was a great gun. One of the best. One of the best. Started out as an anti-aircraft gun. And then, during the invasion of France, when British tanks broke through, the gunners had to depress their barrels on the 88s, and they found, gee, this works against tanks. And all of a sudden, now, German anti-tank battalions are now carting around 88s. And you talk to, talk to American and British soldiers, whew, wow, the range was enough. Wow. Well, no, it was, a anti, it was an anti-aircraft gun first. Then they were using it for a regular artillery piece, but a lot of times, anti-armor, anti-tank gun. Uh, and it was a brilliant gun. I mean, it would go right through the armor, right through the armor. Then the Germans figured out, to, to, you know, for the, for, the, for the Panther, their 75 millimeter round, they would put tungsten on the warhead of the round, and the tungsten would go right through the armor, and then boom. Yeah, they figured this out. Tungsten. So now tungsten becomes a strategic commodity here. We need that. So it's a, it's a mind game, too. It's a science game. So, interesting. Interesting. Anybody else have any questions or, or, or comments? No? And when we come back next week, I'm going to talk about the SS. Yeah, it gets better as it goes along here, you know?